Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Nargis Kasenova, and I'm a senior fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the roundtable, Understanding the kyrgyz tajik border conflict, co-organized by the Davis Center and the OXO Society for Central Asian Affairs. And I will co-moderate it together with my dear colleague, Dr. Edward Lemon, president and founder of the OXO Society. Exactly three weeks ago, we were shocked by the dramatic events along the kyrgyz tajik border. Dozens of people were killed, hundreds wounded, thousands had to flee or were evacuated. The scale of violence was unprecedented. We saw a new interstate political dynamics and also the demonstration of the power of social media. So what has happened? What are the implications and what can or should be done? We have an excellent panel with us today to help us understand the drivers of the conflict, the factors and actors shaping it, as well as dynamics and prospects for the future development of Kyrgyz-Tajik relations. I will introduce them in a minute, but first I want to call on the participants of the event in this Zoom room and also watching us on YouTube to maintain the spirit of an academic discussion, be open-minded and polite. It is our role as an academic expert community to analyze developments with a cool head, being as objective and free of bias as possible. And of course, it is a big challenge when your compatriots, neighbors, people you feel special affinity to are heard. Our first speaker today is Dr. Sherbek Juraev, co-founder and president of Crossroads Central Asia. And he's also an associate research fellow at the OAC Academy in Bishkek. Welcome, Sherbe. Uh, he will be followed by Dr. Parvis Mulajanov, um, who is a political scientist, historian, and currently a visiting re researcher at SS Paris and senior advisor to the International Alert Office in Tajikistan. Thank you. Uh, we also have with us uh, Professor Martha Brill Olkert, who is a visiting professor at James Madison College, Michigan State University, and Professor Emerita at Colgate University. Previously, she was a senior associate with the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment in Washington, DC. Last but not least, we have Dr. Dmitry Gorenburg with us, who is a Davis Center associate and senior research scientist at CNA. He's an expert on security issues in the former Soviet Union, Russian military reform, Russian foreign policy, and ethnic politics and identity. I'm very happy you're joining us today. Uh, and uh, let's, without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's go to the presentations. And um, I want to ask Sherbek to start. And let me remind you that we, we put a limit of five, six minutes for, for presentation so that we have a uh, good amount of time for, for discussions and Q&A. Please share that. Okay, uh, good evening and uh, good evening in Bishkek. Good morning in the US and uh, good day of the time, a good time of the day anyway. Right? Thank you very much Nargis uh, for the introduction and uh, to you and Ed for organizing this event today. It is quite unfortunate that we are gathering today to discuss, again, the violence and conflict in Central Asia. Uh, that's, but that's what we have today. Commenting on what happened three weeks ago between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan is a challenge for two reasons. First, of course, this is a conflict with multiple explanatory layers and with too many elephants in the room, depending on the level of analysis and or depending on research interests, we can speak about the critical role of the Soviet Union's drawing of the boundaries and creating republics, creating nations. Or we can also speak about the incompetent, corrupt, and even criminal governments that Central Asian population ended up having after 1991. We can speak about water, we can speak about the climatic conditions in the area that make water a much different uh, sort of resource than we see in, in other parts of the world. That's one reason. Second reason is that, as Nargis just said, we have just five minutes for speaker. So it's a challenge to cover the entire story. So given that, I will limit myself to literally two observations, if I managed three, but probably two points on what 
we would take away out of what happened in April. And uh, since I sit in Bishkek and uh, my parents happened to be in Batken region exactly in those weeks when the events unfolded, I may not be the, uh, I may not have the most balanced information, just any of us, but uh, I'll try to uh, cover issues as I see more of from academic point of view. So the first point draws directly from the events in April. Uh, and the point is that what we saw is a dramatically new level of interstate conflict in Central Asia. That is what we as observers, as academics should really recognize, acknowledge and uh, remember. The first, of course, obviously the scale of conflict was unprecedented with the local population and politicians in Kyrgyzstan particularly referring to the events, not as a conflict, but as a war. That's what we hear in the news on a daily basis. And that's what we hear from people on the ground. What happened was a war, not a conflict. Second, uh, what happened was really the first instance in Central Asia, I think, when one country's military was trespassing the border, shelling the civilian population and uh, literally occupying for several days the settlements, the villages of the neighboring country. In the vocabulary of international relations, that would be qualified as an act of aggression or a military invasion. Obviously, political leaders in the region are very hesitant. Both in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, I haven't seen politicians using these terms, but uh, that's what happened. So to be clear on this, Geographically, we have to acknowledge that there were two different arenas of conflict. One where the conflict actually started was Batken, uh, near, bordering with Tajikistan's Varuk and Isfara. The conflict erupted there over the water facility, water supply facility called Kalavnoi. And uh, it started as a confrontation between the residents, which quickly evolved into a military confrontation. And uh, of with usage of helicopters, uh, mortars, and uh, so that was quite unprecedented. But the second arena of conflict was some 70 kilometers away, and that was in the Lelek district of Kyrgyzstan. Literally on the same day when the intensive fighting happened in Batken, the village, several villages along the border with Tajikistan came under shelling uh, as the population fled some 20 or 30,000 people escaped from shelling. Uh, the Tajikistan's military entered the several villages and uh, the degree of looting and destruction was well covered by, uh, in the reports by BBC and Radio Liberty. So I am drawing this at, uh, to this case, not because I happen to have some uh, direct uh, information coming from Lelek, but for two other reasons. First, uh, I think there is a risk for observers, particularly from outside the region, to overlook the case of unprovoked uh, military attack on civilians because of more conventional framing of events as a border incident or border, border conflict. Even in Kyrgyzstan, in the first days when the fighting was very intensive, the local news agencies kept referring or describing the events as the incident, the border incident, when it was already known that tens of people were uh, killed. So if the events in Batken and Voruch could qualify as a border conflict or a clash where it's not clear which what started first and there's a real necessity for fact-finding mission, what happened in Lelek was quite different. It was, uh, there was no conflict. There was no confrontation between military there. There was just uh, attack on village by military. The second reason why this is important is that the attack in the Lelek village indicates that Central Asia as a region might be on the verge of a different type of conflicts, uh, the full-fledged interstate military conflict. Recently in the post-Soviet space, we have seen more than one case when uh, there is a military solution found to some similar conflicts. And when the winning side or the side that overcomes or overwhelms, uh, declares the achievement as a fait accompli. And uh, the situation starts from there. So that would become a default situation. Today, just today, there was a parliamentary discussions in Kyrgyzstan saying that there are reports about 
trench digged in different parts in the southern part of Tajik Kyrgyzstan in Alayir area, completely different section of Kyrgyz Tajik border. So the tension is still there, and it's apparently there's a preference for military solution in particular circles. Uh, so I think for everyone observing the peace and conflict in Central Asia, these events should be seen as a warning sign about what should you expect. And the second point that I would like to make, uh, if we zoom out a little and use some wide angle lenses, we can say that the state let the population down on both sides of the border. Most issues that cause conflicts today in the border, be it water infrastructure, roads, connecting villages, or the people crossing the borders and being caught as for transgression of the border, they all, all these entities became contested symbols of the state and objects that had to be secured and protected. The, as I said, the conflict in April started over the Galavnoi, the water distribution facility. And it's very similar to many other cases, be it Kyrgyz-Tajik border, be it Kyrgyz-Uzbek border, be it Tajik-Uzbek border. Uh, we have mostly seen the conflicts happening because of the disputed land, disputed, of, disputed infrastructure or disputed road. The state in this case, uh, the, the post-Soviet new states established the borders and created a list of entities on which we disagree. So disputed areas or disputed infrastructure. However, then the governments effectively excuse themselves, both on Kyrgyz and Tajik side, from actually finding solution to make life easier and secure for population on the ground. So to put uh, simply, the newly established states created problems in the border, brought troops and guns, but then left it to the population to figure out how to survive in this uh, newly found unsafe region. So this is the root of the degree of despair and hostility in the region. And the hostility, we have not seen this degree of hostility some 20 years ago, it's growing. And the, the final sentence would be, and I don't, I don't think I'm out of time, yeah. the domestic political situation, both in Tajikistan and in Kyrgyzstan of the past years has not been conducive to effective solution, effective finding of peaceful politically acceptable solutions. And I think we can come back to domestic politics situation in the Q&A session. Here I finish, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herbeck. These are excellent points and I'm so sorry to limit you because, because yes, uh, these, the, we, we could uh, kind of, you could elaborate on those and add more, more uh, important uh, factors. Uh, but let's, let's move to uh, Parviz. Parviz, what's, what's the perception uh, in Tajikistan of these events? And also if you could reflect a little bit on or explain to us uh, uh, the thinking of uh, Tajik policymakers, you know, how they perceive the situation, what were the sort of calculations and... Yeah. Yes, my, my task today as I understood is to do a mapping of the uh, Tajik society perception of the country and which implies that how the public uh, opinion perceives of the country and how the decision-making process of the Tajik society has been evolved. So in the beginning, I would like to say that uh, I would like to stress that the reaction of, uh, to the statements of Tashif and Japarov made during the elections and after the elections with regard to the uh, speeding up the solution of the uh, border uh, pro uh, problems was extremely positive from the Tajik side. After that, the perception, uh, I mean, since February was based on the following complex of uh, facts. First of all, the trip of Tashif to Moscow on the 24th of February, I will explain it later. Then second, the proposal uh, made by Tashif during the meeting uh, uh, of 16, 17 March between the Tajik and uh, Kyrgyz uh, government officials, uh, where he proposed the exchange of Varukh, uh, two equal territories in Kyrgyzstan. And also, I mean, uh, the second proposal was if not, uh, the Kyrgyz side would, do, would make a demar demarcation by its own, on its own terms. So the reaction of the Tajik team, I mean, uh, there was no official response, but later uh, it was also described by uh, former minister of uh, uh, Tajik uh, Foreign Affairs in his letter, uh, which was published. 
and apparently it was approved uh, by the top uh, level, where he described the uh, way it was presented as non-diplomatic uh, and extremely humiliating. And when I was, uh, from my contacts, I discussed this issue with one of the officials. He told me that Tashir just came into a meeting. He said that forget what, what, what was before. Forget about what to, was talking uh, before we were talking before with the other government. We have two proposals. If you accept, accept. If not, we will force you to do that. Yeah, I mean, the reaction was uh, extreme, extreme uh, frustration and uh, it was a real shock. Then uh, the, the next fact was that uh, uh, there was an uh, announcement after that and uh, conducting military exercises on the border area on the March 30, the 1st April, called uh, Security 2021. Then there was uh, announced transportation blockade, closure of the border traffic to Tajikistan imposed by Tashif. And he literally said that we will open the border only after the resolution of the border issues, meaning that only after the Tajik side uh, in, uh, agreed on our uh, proposals. So the overall conclusion of the Tajik side was the following. First, the government and in the government and public opinion in general, the proposals uh, were perceived as, as ultimatum. Second, many concluded that Tashif is so decisive, is so self-confident because he is allegedly backed by Russians. Third, the blockade and military exercises were regarded as methods of military and economic pressure. Uh, and uh, they also concluded that if the pressure is failed, Tashiv and Japarov would uh, use uh, the military forces to impose, to force the Tajik government to ac uh, accept uh, the ultimatum. So the government response was the following. So they started to prepare for repelling of potential attacks starting from diplomatic efforts to logistic ones on the ground. As much as I know, I don't have access to the government of uh, plants, but as much as I know from our formal sources, the idea was to stop the advanced forces on the border. If not, uh, the small group, groups of militia were supposed to target the advanced forces on the ground. The strategic plan was the following. In case of attack, to repel and to force Japarov and Tashiv to withdraw its, uh, their ultimatum and to return to the previous terms, meaning, I mean, the previous terms, the previous agreement reached in previous years. Uh, no plans for seizure of any part of other sides of the border was envisaged. So there was, uh, therefore, I would call uh, just not to use such words as aggression, because aggression meaning that when you have uh, Germany and the United, uh, I mean, for, for the Soviet Union, yes, there was aggression. There was no shooting from the Russians from the Soviet side. When you have uh, the shooting from the both sides, this is already not aggression, first of all. Second, we have a lot of videos, both sides have a lot of videos about people speaking in the Tajik, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, burning the houses. We have also a number of uh, videos where uh, the Spetsnaz Boru attacking the Tajik frontier station, border post. And according to the Tajik side uh, arguments, we have all facts proving that the first clashes started in the Galovno distribution center. The first burned houses were on the Tajik side. So the trespassing, first of all, was uh, uh, conducted uh, through the Tajik uh, border uh, in uh, Galovno distribution center. First attacked village was Haji Allo. 17 houses were burned there. And after, only after that, the clashes started in other uh, villages. So let's be very careful with such accusations because they are not provable. In my opinion, the fighting 
was started from the both sides. The first attack was uh, in uh, Khoji Allah, and then the other uh, fights were starting along the, uh, the along the borders in other parts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Parviz. Uh, well. Um... Uh, well, Sherbeck mentioned elephants in the room, and I guess the biggest elephant in the room is Russia. And well, uh, Parviz also, also managed this kind of alleged support of Russia for Tashif, but there are other opinions that actually Russia is behind that, 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 that supporting the Tajik side. So, uh, and also, you know, there's basically a lot of talk. Uh, Talk regarding regarding this issue, there are different opinions whether Russia is interested in the conflict or not interested in the conflict, right? Uh, so, uh, Dmitry, can you shed some light on the on the situation? Well, I, I can try. Um, so, uh, I, I'm going to make uh, just three uh, three quick points. Uh, first of all, I think there is a tendency in certainly in the media, but among some some observers of the region to Sort of assume that Russia has its uh, its nefarious hand in all aspects of uh, politics and conflicts in every part of the uh, you know former Soviet Union. And I just want to sort of put in a little note, note of caution there uh, because the one thing that we've seen fairly consistently uh, in Central Asia is that Russia has demonstrated a relative unwillingness to intervene in conflicts in the region. Uh, uh, certainly, I mean, maybe more so in the early 90s, but, uh, uh, but, but in the Latin, you know, under Putin for sure. Uh, most famously, this was the, you know, in the June 2010 riots in, in Kyrgyzstan when there were actually requests for assistance from Russia that were uh, rejected. Uh, so, but, the, but they also, didn't do anything about the various uh, uh, cases of uh, government uh, governments being overthrown in Kyrgyzstan uh, in 2010 and 2020. Uh, so uh, I think that we just, I, I just want to highlight that this is a local issue first and, and you know, Russia gets involved certainly on, on a political level, but is not super interested in, in the, you know, getting involved on the military side. Uh, now, what Russia has done is it's used the uh, state weakness in the region, um, especially in Kyrgyzstan, to some extent also in Tajikistan, to cement it, uh, its influence, particularly in the security sphere. So it's over the years, it's expanded military bases uh, in, in both countries, and, uh, and uh, it uh, recently uh, carried out a fairly large uh, joint military exercise with, with Tajikistan. Uh, so, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but, uh, uh, but so, the, so there are, Russia is involved, but just not in that way, not in this kind of manipulating uh, uh, situation way. One other point, uh, minor point on that is that uh, it does seem like the CSTO uh, is, uh, is, it highlights once again, the CSTO is not that useful for these kinds of uh, situations. It has, it, its history is kind of, it neither prevents clashes uh, nor is it that effective in restoring peace. It's usually uh, when uh, peace efforts are more done on a bilateral basis with some other country rather than the CSTO itself. Uh, my second major point is that uh, it may be that uh, this um, military exercise I mentioned, which took place in, in April, and there were 50,000 or so personnel involved, although only about, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, 9,000 troops from Tajikistan, 2,000 troops from uh, the 201st uh, uh, Russian uh, division, uh, but um, uh, and then non non military personnel as well. Uh, but this may have made Tajikistan feel more confident in its relationship uh, with Russia, uh, and then and thus may have had some impact on its uh, this uh, willingness to to undertake this this operation. Now the the exercise the agenda was a joint operation aimed at preventing a border breach, and so so. You know, the, the, this this is kind of a uh, an effort to to in, in, increase interoperability, I guess is, is uh, the right way to put it, uh, between Russian and, and, and Tajik troops. Uh, Kyrgyzstan hasn't really had that kind of a large military exercise with Russia, uh, and so uh, combined with that, the, the perceived weakness of the current government, maybe that 
played a role in, in the dynamics there. I'm not a I'm not an expert on Central Asian domestic politics, so I won't go much beyond that that sort of thought. Uh, but but then there was also the second part of that that Tajikistan Russia relationship was the the optics of uh, uh, President Rahmon being the only pre uh, foreign leader uh, in Moscow uh, on Victory Day. It was after the conflict, but nonetheless, it's sort of kind of, again, highlight. I mean, these kinds of optics are very important uh, in the region and beyond. And so it, it makes, whether or not it's true, it creates this perception that Tajikistan has a closer relationship with Russia uh, and is using it perhaps to gain advantage uh, in the region, uh, especially since Putin uh, mentioned the need to strengthen Tajikistan's armed forces and Russia's presence in Tajikistan after their, uh, their meeting uh, in Moscow. So uh, while, while recent Russian comments in, on Kyrgyzstan have been much more focused on calling for internal stability and that sort of thing, rather than any kind of let's, let's have a closer relationship. So, so my, uh, let me just conclude with um, kind of a, a little bit of a more of a general point, which is uh, that Russian policy on Central Asia, it seems to me is becoming uh, increasingly cautious. Uh, there's, uh, there's some belief in, among Russian uh, analysts that uh, the Russia's economic interests in the region are, are relatively limited and there, there's no serious security threat uh, 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 for Russia from coming from the region. The only real challenger uh, in, for Russian Central Asia is China uh, and Russian leaders see relations there as, as pretty friendly. Uh, there is this, uh, there's this belief in geopolitical competition between Russia and China uh, over Central Asia, but I think it exists in the minds of Western analysts uh, much more strongly than among Russian leaders. So to my mind, Russia wants to preserve uh, regional stability at relatively low cost and without getting entangled in, um, in local conflicts. And I think this ex explains some of its reluctance to intervene in, these, in the recent clash and suggests that it will stay out of the active phase of any future conflicts much as it did in 2010, and as it did in, in the Karabakh war in, in the Caucasus quite, quite recently. Uh, so, but Russia is happy to facilitate ceasefires or peace talks after the fact, uh, particularly you know, because it can use those to, uh, to, to become the guarantor of, of the situation and increase its own influence while it, you know, at a much lower risk. So I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Smithy. Does Russia need another base in the region or not? In your in your view, what's there? Well, need need is a. <laughs> uh, I I don't think so. I don't. I mean, I mean, it would certainly be interested in in having uh, uh, facilities on a, in a different part of Central Asia, but that's much less in the you know like uh, farther farther west. But that's much more complicated with Turkmenistan and those things. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Martha, can we turn to you? Uh, you've spent decades following developments uh, developments in the region, starting from the late uh, late Soviet times. Uh, what's the big picture? If you can kind of contextualize what we just discussed. Thank you, thank you, and I'll try to be brief. First of all, everybody else has covered so much territory, leaving me not so much to cover. And second of all, I see that we have more than two dozen questions out there waiting for us. I wanna make four um, overarching points. Um, first, I wanna go back to some, some of the things that Shire Beck said at the beginning. I think it's very important for us to look at the events of what's happened in the region um, in terms of the confluence of two different um, factors. Um, the first is the increased politicization of the environment that was going on at the time, at least in Kyrgyzstan, at the time that these events um, that these events played out. Um, it, it seems to me, as I look at what happened, is the question of how does localized points of tension become escalated when the escalation is part of a broader political agenda of one of the two parties of, of the conflict. And, and that seems to me the real risk of what happened in um, between the Kyrgyz and the Tajiks at this point in time. That in preparing for today, I went back over 
the history of the tension, and this comes after a conversation Agis and I had, um, it, if we go back, it's impossible even to know where we begin to, to talk about the local tension between the Kyrgyz and Tajik populations along that border. Um, and, and do we start in 1921, 1924, 1927, when there was tension over where the Tajiks used the maps from that period to assert their claim um, to Varukh and to, to the definition, to the delineation of the border up there. Do we go back to the 1950s, late 1950s, when the Kyrgyz used their maps from that period, the de decisions made on allocation of territory? Um, do we go back and look at the border tensions or conflicts small conflicts between these communities. And I made a list of the dates that they occurred, 1936, 1938, 1969, 1975, 1989. And that conflict, I was at least in some of these areas during right after 2000, 2003, 2005, 2008, 2013, 14, and 2016. Um, so in my mind, the, the tension between these two populations is, is gonna remain. Um, I would argue that it will be very hard to actually remedy on the ground. That, that doesn't mean I'm implying they have to escalate, but when you go through the lengthy local literature on the source of the tensions between the communities, especially around the enclave of Varukh and the concerns of residents in Bat Ken, um, you find several factors that have been consistent and I think are unlikely to find quick solutions. I don't think there's likely to be a satisfactory decision on the exchange of territory, but I could certainly be wrong about that. Um, second, I don't think there's likely to be a better, I don't think there is likely to have, um, let me think of how to put it, Part of the, the tension has been over the inadequacy of water resources and the way water resources are used. And I don't see efficiency in the use of water resources coming anytime soon in much of, not just that region, but the broader agricultural usage throughout Central Asia. Um, next, there's complaint and some of these disputes have come in the past over the, the fact that in the 2000s, the borders became first more militarized and then um, jointly patrolled or patrolled by the respective uh, border, border guards, depending upon what part of the long Kyrgyz Tajik border we're talking about. And a lot, of, and many of these earlier disputes were, um, the, the source of them came from what I would just describe as corruption or abuse by border guards. And I don't think we're about to enter a period in which the border guards throughout this region, especially in rem remote locations, I could go on about the different incidents I personally have seen along some of the slightly more popular borders and um, populated borders. So I don't think we're about to enter a period where corruption at the level of borders is gonna disappear. So I think this question of local irritants is likely to remain and, and these aren't the only points in the region where local irritants periodically pop up. What was different here was the way in which the, the conflict played out. And that takes me to my final set of points, which are really the question of um, what are the potential ways to separate out the, the inherent tensions that now seem to be coming up in various parts of Central Asia, but we saw it manifested here between um, <clears throat> what I would say is, if not the fragility of states, the identity problems of states as they enter their third, as they go through and enter their fourth decade, the beginning of their fourth decade of existence. And what we have is very different political environments emerging in the five countries, but especially where you have Kyrgyzstan, where you have had so many more regimes, so many more changes of power, democratic, um, but nonetheless contestations of power than you have any place else in, in Central Asia. And so what you have are increasing tensions over how you can attain increased regional security at a time in which the states themselves 
are evolving into um, more stable forms of identity that are really distinct from one another. And then just to finally add, to reassert some of what Dimitri said, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not either criticizing or advocating an enhanced role of Russia. I just agree with him. I don't see it coming. And, and I think if we talk about international attention to what's happening in between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, it's really very minimal. I mean, it may be in the community of Central Asian specialists and diplomats that have to deal with this part of the world that we see this attention, but we have to realize that this is tension, this tension is going on against a background of fighting in the Middle East. Um, and for an international community, it's just not gonna be high on the, the level of issues in which there's an ex expectation of broader international involvement, which really leaves it to the region, to regional mechanisms and to those regional organizations, which the countries in Central Asia are a part of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Well, we have plenty to discuss, Ed. Uh, okay, please, the mic is yours. Well, thank you to the panelists. We have over 40 questions in the Q&A, um, so, and only 25 minutes left. So unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to get to everyone's questions. So I'll do my best to gather questions. And to pick up on, on Martha's point at the end, maybe a, a question that you can build on Martha and, and maybe Dima can also jump in related to the international community. Can the border conflict be solved without a third party mediator? Um, what is your perspective on You've just told us why the international community maybe has a limited interest in this conflict. You know, what role can it play or should it play going forward or should um, it, should the solution be found between, between the two countries or maybe from a third mediator from the region itself, Uzbekistan, that has played and attempted to play a mediating role in the conflict so far. So if, if Martha and, and, and Dima can jump in on that quickly, then we'll move to the next question. I'll start if that's okay. I would say that this would be a great opportunity for enhanced regional mediation. I think that if Uzbek efforts at mediation, and of course Uzbekistan has its own tensions, historic tensions with both Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, but if the combination of Uzbekistan or to the degree to which Kazakhstan is gonna feel comfortable getting engaged, I think that would be a model not just to help resolve this conflict, but to take forward in the future, because it's hard to imagine that tensions, that there won't be periodic um, bursts of the need for regional mediation. And the states that have the greatest impact from <coughs> the, the tension, I mean, the states that lose the most, of course, are the, the neighbors of both countries, especially with Afghanistan, which we haven't talked about today, but with the changing dynamic in Afghanistan, it becomes all the more important for the Central Asian countries to be able to, to find at least an enhanced environment for regional dialogue that even if it doesn't solve problems in the long run, at least serves as mechanisms of de-escalation so that you can return to uneasy status quos, but status quos that have been there for a long time. Yeah, I, I pretty much uh, agree. I do. Th I think that uh, the that you, it, some outside mediation is necessary. I don't think it's something that can be just solved uh, bilaterally. Um, and and Russia could do it, uh, but I think I agree with Martha. I think that, you know, something, you know, in some ways the region might be, uh, it, it, it might be good uh, uh, development if if it were. Uh, Regional. I'll I'll stop there. So we can have more 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 rounds of questions. Well, thank you for that response. And the next question is to Shaimek and, and Parviz. There are a number of questions around the role of informal um, groups, be they organised criminal groups or militias. We've obviously seen the government of, of, of Kyrgyzstan discussing today, I think in Parliament, as Shaibek said, a bill to arm civilians on the border and, and form various militias. We've also seen Tajikistan from the reporting that we have sending up various um, armed formations, some of whom fought during the civil war up to the border. So what role did these informal groups play in stoking and, and, and driving the conflict and what role are they going to play going forward? And then a follow-up question specifically for Shia Beck around how has this affected Japarov's popularity, his legitimacy as a, as a new president? Um, you know, how has this affected his, his, his position 
um, in power. So uh, if, if Ardis maybe wants to speak first and then try to reflect on those two questions. Uh, the, so the role of uh, informal uh, groups, uh, there was uh, participation from the both sides. And this, at, this, at the same time, the both governments actually tried to limit the volunteer activities and the movement. Because uh, it's obviously if you uh, will give we will give them uh, ammunition weaponry, sooner or later it would affect the political situation within the country. So both in Tajikistan there was a volunteer movement, but the government didn't allow to uh, to expand. And as much as I know, there was the same on the Kyrgyz side. There was also some. Uh, Mobilization on the uh, uh, in on both sides of the border on the village uh, level, but also the government tried to limit it, not to give it. Of course, if there would be further expansion of the military activities, there would be much larger uh, large scale mobilization uh, organized by both uh, sides. But so far, like likely, I mean, it wasn't continued uh, for for a longer period. And we've just had a question in the chat that maybe I can I can follow up with you on Parviz around what the implications are for Rahman's popularity, um, and you know how how is, has this um, unified the Tajik people? How has it affected Rahman's legitimacy? The, the, the government in general, the government popularity is under threat, uh, under the pressure today because of the complicated economic uh, situation and social situation and. Uh, decreasing level of uh, living standards uh, in the country. And of course, uh, this is one of the reasons why the government should uh, take and will take into account the public opinion. It uh, is not, uh, I mean, it cannot just uh, disregard it while uh, conducting negotiations with the other side. So it will always will be taken into account. Okay, thank you, Pavis. Uh, Shabek? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, on the informal groups, but uh, let me very briefly come back to Pavis' uh, notion that uh, some usage of the concept would not be very appropriate. Basically, my assumption is that we're not going to speak on behalf of our respective governments, and uh, we couldn't, even if we wanted. But uh, I do accept Parvi's point that the entire conflict could not and should not be portrayed as an act of invasion. And I do accept the fact that uh, Kyrgyz politicians, and you know the Kyrgyz political system is entirely very different from what we see in Tajikistan. The provocative statements were there and they were very provocative even for the, by the standards of Kyrgyzstan. However, that said, I think uh, I already wrote to Parvis in some other domains, but I think I would repeat that it's not, it is quite straightforward to look at the map and to how else you would evaluate and qualify the developments in an area where there was no military confrontation, there was no mutual exchange of fire, but then suddenly people get displaced because of the shelling from the other side. And the evidence on media is compelling and uh, that's not only Kyrgyz media, but international. So. Uh, while I would not deliberately try to point the blame on a particular side because border conflicts are always complicated and they always have different size uh, role and input. But I don't think that we as observers, as academics would uh, or should ignore this novelty of the conflict. This is a kind of thing that has not happened in the past, neither with between Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan or between Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, if you do not, ex uh, with the exception of the Farhat Dam, where Tajikistan actually did a fait accompli operation in 2002. So, uh, though with those caveats, now I turn to the question by Ed uh, on the criminal groups. In fact, in Kyrgyz media, there was ample circulation of the evidence and footings from uh, footage from the Tajikistan with the some former field commanders. Uh, operating on the side of uh, Tajikistan. In Kyrgyzstan, we don't have the equivalent of uh, civil war participants of the Tajikistan. We don't have that as simple as that. Uh, however, we can also, uh, we should comment on the fact that Sadr Japarov, 
declared in, the, in his speech that one of the responses of Kyrgyzstan should be to move to uh, militia, basically to develop, uh, to involve the local residents, uh, to train them and to use them uh, as potential uh, guardians of the area. This was, in my view, uh, quite a reflection of very haphazard, very uh, uh, desperate attempt to find a solution to military because in Lelek particular, the, the other Japarov suffered very huge blow on his reputation because people were basically observing from distance their villages, and the Kyrgyz border guards wouldn't do anything, even if there were a couple of uh, 10 or 20 military. So the Sadr Japar got under huge pressure in Bishkek with uh, about 2,000 people on the, on, the, on the square. And I'm sure Sadr Japar was very scared about his office on the, in those hours. And the crowd was basically demanding, give us guns and why you're not ordering the response, uh, the shooting against the villagers, against the occupants. So uh, I think uh, this is the some way acceptance that the establishment of military parity will most likely require that the local population should become the active force. So, but I'm not sure. I don't think at all that that's going to travel for too long unless we see. Uh, other developments. As for Sadr Japar's uh, standing, it was negative, I think. Uh, it's hard to judge, but uh, Sadr Japar was not in a position where he felt that the military action would benefit his standing. And uh, the overall impression from the entire conflict is that Kyrgyz side was forced to sign whatever was signed in on the 1st of May. So it was the end of the conflict where Tajikistan had an upper hand literally blocking the road leading to in, uh, blocking the entire district in, in the Western Kyrgyzstan uh, for several hours. And uh, we already had the news about the people running out of medication, running out of food. So I don't think Sadr Japar won anything. And as for uh, Rahman Parviz said, but uh, in Kyrgyzstan, just for the sake of uh, information, there's a strong popularity of the argument that Rahman needed, uh, according to this diversionary war theory, a small victorious war somewhere to prop up his standing domestically. Wonderful, thank you, Shabek. Um, sure, you have one minute. Yeah. First of all, we have, uh, I mean, the Tajik side has all evidences that the shooting started along the border. So the advance of the Tajik force wasn't provoked, wasn't, the first one, it was the response to the shooting. The advance also started, first of all, as I mentioned, in the Galavno distribution center and Hojalo village. So that's why I believe that it's too early to say that, for instance, who advanced and who uh, was a winner, who was, a who was defeated. There was no winner in this uh, confrontation. It was just one day, actually, confrontation, military confrontation. That's all. What would happen after two days or three days, nobody knows. And now, uh, for now, the Kyrgyz government is, is, is trying to present this uh, conflict to its own people just to justify its own mistakes, its own uh, provocative uh, statements, its own provocative uh, uh, deeds, uh, its own uh, provocative threats, and uh, just because they uh, miscalculated the capacity of the of the Tajik side, they believed that it would be very easy to enforce, uh, first of all, their uh, their position on the Tajik side, and by that to improve their position within the within the state. We know that there is competition between. Uh, Japarov uh, and uh, uh, Tashiv. There are also uh, an increasing fight within the Kyrgyz government. So, I mean, uh, therefore, this is, uh, according to the Tajik side, whatever happened on the border is also a reflection of what is going on inside Kyrgyzstan. Of course, there is also a reflection on the Tajik side, but uh, I don't think that uh, Rahman uh, I'm not supportive of Rahman, but I don't think that Rahman was planning a victorious war. 
because it's impossible to get victory in such parity uh, of the of the conflict side. And everybody, I mean, everybody understand that. And I also believe that neither Japarov nor uh, Tashiv were not going to have uh, to open uh, a new war. They're not going to open uh, uh, to launch a new confrontation. The idea was to make pressure using the difficult economic and social situation of Tajikistan. They believe the Tajik government would be forced to agree on the ultimatum. Plus, they used also the means of uh, imposing, uh, I mean, uh, making pressure on the uh, people around the president of, uh, of Tajikistan because there, there were several companies uh, closely related to the uh, transportation of oil and petroleum through the border, both legal and illegal. So they believed, Tashir believed that if he closed the border, so the, the local lobby companies will lobby, uh, uh, would force the government, the Tajik government to accept the ultimatum. When it failed, so now they're trying to justify just offering uh, I mean, their own reading of the of the conflict presenting into the both first of all to the uh, internal society, but and, and to international society as an aggression. Okay, thank you, Fabis. Um, we have a question around the capacity of, of, of the both militaries and the degree of command and control. Um, that's probably best answered by Gina. What degree of command and control do the Tajik and Kyrgyz militaries have? What did, what did the conflict tell us about their capacities, respectively? I'm afraid I'm not a, an expert on the Central Asian militaries, uh, their you know, internal functioning, so I don't think I have enough knowledge to, to, to answer that, I'm afraid. Maybe Pavis or Hoshaibek. Uh, and it was cut off uh, connection. The, the, what did the conflict tell about the respective military capacities, degree of command and control in each uh, each of the militaries, the Tajik and the Kyrgyz? You mean, the, uh, uh, I think there is, uh, I mean, the both sides controlling the armed forces and frontiers, but uh, if uh, uh, they would continue to arm uh, uh, locals, uh, paramilitaries. It would be very difficult to control them. Sure. And so then we have sure. that, uh, being of a military, it's hard to claim, and particularly in a combative perspective. However, uh, what I hear from the field is that there was a very limited use of military, at least particularly from Kyrgyz side, simply because except for Batken part, in the Lelek, there was simply no military uh, and uh, there was nothing to use there. There were just groups of border troops, which are usually normally armed by small arms rather than uh, light or heavy arm, uh, weapons. So, but otherwise, yeah, I, I don't think that I would uh, dare to answer this question of the quality of the command. And then we have a raft of questions around the role that civil society can play. There's already been a working group set up. Obviously, the people in the border communities themselves are the ones who've been most affected by this. You know, is um, is also a humanitarian situation as we've already alluded to. Um, what role can the border communities themselves, civil society in each country, and, and women? Um, it's a question around what role women can play in in peace building. So um, that's probably a question. Maybe if Martha, you wanted to to pick up on first. I think you're on mute. Okay, uh, like Dimitri passing on the command and control, I think it really would be better for Shirebeck and Parviz to talk about what they see as the capacity of civil society groups, especially when we're talking about groups in, in regions rather than the capitals. So Shirebeck, do you want to go first and then Parviz? Uh, I think that uh, the capacity of civil society in Tajikistan is very limited uh, because of the nature of uh, political space inside the country. They are out of the decision-making uh, process. Of course, they can affect uh, uh, on the public opinion and the public opinion, the current situation should be taken, will be taken by the government anyway. 
uh, but uh, in general, uh, uh, this is also related to the prospects of the negotiations, future negotiations, because for the Tajik government, it will be much easier to enforce the implementation of uh, some provisions that even uh, if those provisions would be re uh, rejected by the locals, by local uh, communities. Uh, and the government is not so really, uh, so uh, so dependent on the public opinion and in Kyrgyzstan, for instance. In Kyrgyzstan situation different, you can take it as an example in a situation with the, an attempt to resolve the border issues with Uzbekistan before the Tajik conflict. When the agreement was signed, and then it was rejected because of the objection of the local community. On the Tajik side, I don't think it would be possible unless the government would make too much compromises. So if there would be too much compromises, of course, there would be big resentment on the ground. But unless if there would be some compromises, some concessions, some uh, steps forward, in this case, if there would be mutual mutual process of compromises and concessions, in this case, uh, on the Tajik side, uh, there is much more possibility to uh, enforce the uh, implementation. I don't think that would be so easy on the Kyrgyz side. Uh, Beck, what are your thoughts on the role of civil society? Is it my turn, right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, on civil society. Yes, I think it makes sense to speak of the civil society in the region. Uh, as for the Dushanbe and Bishkek crowds, the NGOs, I think there was a joint statement by civil societies of both countries, which is very encouraging, uh, but it also suggests how the, what we call civil society live in a world that is slightly different from the world where the national governments and the, the rest of the population live. As for the border community, I'm afraid that the events of the past weeks blew severe damage to the ability of the border communities to interact. In fact, and I agree with some comments on the, on the questions, the many bordering villages have been ha, have had centuries of interaction. In fact, the entire Sogd, Leninabatsk uh, Oblast that used to be called, uh, there are the villages where the many people from Leilek actually lived in the past. So there was no really uh, delineation. However, what, how exactly the villagers will be living next to each other from today when they saw what happened with uh, tens of civilians killed by arms, by military, it will be very difficult. Uh, but even without that, uh, and I agree on the comments that the governments are the elephants in the room. The state securitized the border issues to the extent that uh, the population now is a bit different from what we had 20 years ago. There's a huge sense of insecurity. There's a huge sense of hostility, to be honest. Uh, it's not a popular thing among academics to speak about the population. Okay, they all want peace and the governments are bad. But in fact, if you go to the area, uh, there's a huge level of distrust. Okay, of course, thanks to the government. And uh, the border communities can only help this reconciliation and uh, trust building when the governments declare that they are use military, that they are open, they are going to open border and not the closed border, and uh, they will be encouraging the exchange trade and so on. All of uh, the movements for the civil society, for the United Nations and other peace building initiatives like uh, but without the government's effort those are not going to be any effective we should mention also that uh, civil society could play uh, also different role i mean when you're talking about the civil society we usually envisage uh, the space between individual and the state filled by different kind of uh, numer numerous uh, uh, organization uh, ranging from the professional NGOs to CBOs, uh, community-based organizations. So, I mean, the so referred uh, traditional civic network could play a different role. I mean, it could play a role of mediator uh, in the peace process, 
but it could play also a role of mobilizing, mobilizing role, mobilizing uh, the uh, local communities uh, for, uh, for confrontation. So it depends how the government uh, policy is shaped because in some cases, in some conflicts, we know that the government tries to involve local communities uh, and local community organizations in the confrontation uh, with the, the other side. Thank you very much, Parviz. Uh, um, I think we all appreciate this nuanced, uh, nuanced take. Uh, and um, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, and I want to thank the panelists for this great discussion. I think this 60 minutes really enhanced our understanding of uh, what has happened, uh, can happen. Uh, and um, I want to also thank the, the audiences for tuning in. Um, I want to thank our partners at the Oxus Society for Central Asian Affairs and uh, particularly uh, my partner in crime, um, Ed Lemon. And I want to thank the wonderful uh, Davis Center um, events team, uh, Penny and Daniel, who provided this the, the perfect uh, the perfect logistics for, for this event and I also want to use this opportunity to um, to flag the event we're having tomorrow uh, we are launching um, Caspiana digital toolbox for students and scholars of Central Asia and uh, the South Caucasus uh, in the morning at 9 uh, 9 a.m eastern time tomorrow please please join us thank you very much